Or I should start off by saying good evening. Uh, my name is Alex Gates, and I am the executive director uh, and curator of the Canadian Automotive Museum uh, in Oshawa, Ontario. On behalf of everyone at the museum, I'm glad you're able to join us tonight uh, as we continue to ca share Canada's automotive heritage. Tonight, we once again have more than 100 participants uh, who have logged in to join us from across Canada and the United States. To begin with, let me just cover a few technical details for everyone who's watching this. Uh, we are using the Zoom webinar platform. So as a participant, you're able to see the presentation, but all of your cameras and sound are off. So you can just sit back uh, and relax this evening. So tonight's format is actually a Q&A, which is a little different from some of our other presentations we've done. So you're going to use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the screen, and we're going to answer as many questions as possible during the next hour. So Demerick, who's our special projects coordinator here at the museum, he's going to monitor the Q&A throughout the evening, and he's going to consolidate some of the questions and we'll throw them uh, to our two guests this evening. If there's something we're not able to get to, uh, we can certainly follow up with you later after the talk uh, with all the emails uh, that you provided to register. Uh, just so everyone knows, uh, we are recording this talk uh, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel later, uh, as well as becoming available uh, next month in our October e-newsletter. So you can uh, look forward to that as well. Following this talk, uh, you will receive a follow-up email uh, with some feedback uh, that you can provide. We appreciate uh, any feedback you can give us on how we can improve our talks. Uh, our third Thursday Zoom series is going to continue in October. Uh, so our next two speakers uh, for October is going to be George Webster, uh, who is going to so speak on the history of F1 racing in Canada. Uh, and then in uh, November, uh, we're going to have a, a great speaker, uh, Rudy Kroken. Uh, and he is going to talk about uh, the first car to ever come to Canada in 1866, uh, which is known as Father Belcourt's car. Uh, so that's going to be uh, quite an interesting talk as well on, on very different uh, subject matters uh, here uh, for the Automotive Museum. Uh, finally, thank you to our sponsors tonight. Uh, first of all, Hagerty, uh, who is our title sponsor for this series. Uh, Hagerty has come on for the 2021-2022 series. Uh, but also thank you to all of our individual donors uh, who made donations to the museum uh, as uh, part of this uh, lecture series uh, to support the museum. Uh, it's been a rough year and a half uh, with all the lockdowns and so forth, and we really appreciate all of your support uh, as we continue uh, to do programming and have the museum reopen to the public. So I'll turn it over to our, uh, our speakers now. Let me quickly introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Dr. Sandy Bigman. Uh, Dr. Bigman uh, is uh, the donor of our 1975 Brickland SV1, which is now at the museum. Um, and someone asked what kind of dog you have in that photo, Dr. Bigman. So that's gonna be one of our first questions. Miniature Australian Shepherd. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, so Dr. Bigman is actually joining us from his dental office in California, uh, where the weather's probably just as nice as it is here in Toronto these days. If we, if we got you uh, in January, it'd probably be a bit of a different story. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Bigman uh, was the original purchaser of his 1975 Brickland SV1 and uh, held on to it until February 2020 uh, when it arrived at the Automotive Museum. Uh, and our extra special guest tonight is, of course, Malcolm Bricklin himself. Uh, and uh, it, I don't even know where to start sometimes with, with his autobiography, his biography here. Um, let's just flip through some of the, the photos really quick uh, to remind us of, of some of the ventures that he's uh, been involved in. Wow. Uh, so first being, and this is, here's the glamour shot, the, the Fuji rabbit, uh, bringing those to North America. I don't know if anyone, I, I, I wonder if anyone watching tonight uh, joined in just to hear about the Fuji rabbit. Uh, what do we have next, Merrick? Um, Subaru what's 360 and Subaru of America. We got, we got the Subaru, bringing Subaru to, uh, to America as well. Um, I saw one of these a few years ago at the auto show and they are, they are just fun little cars. Uh, and what else can we say about uh, the uh, Subaru Fast Track, the Brickland Fast Track, one of the first uh, fiberglass or plastic bodied cars in North America? Very cool. Um, a, yeah, a lot of firsts here. Obviously, the Brickland uh, SV1, uh, which has made its way onto a Canadian postage stamp, um, uh, as well as into our museum. Arguably the most famous Canadian car, Canadian built car uh, of all time. Uh, sorry, Sam McLaughlin. I think. 
the Bricklin has more name recognition nowadays. Anything else? Uh, the Yugo, you can't beat the Yugo as well. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, I just, it's just so wild, the, the number of car brands, the recognizable car brands uh, and stories and periods uh, that Mr. Bricklin has been uh, involved with uh, up to today as well. And uh, here we have uh, the latest project that he's working on, which we hope he will speak a little bit more about tonight uh, with visionary vehicles uh, working on uh, electric cars. Uh, maybe he's going to space soon as well. I don't know. Uh, we have a lot to cover tonight. Uh, I don't think so, but you never know with, with Malcolm Bricklin. Any other photos there, Demerick? Uh, I think that's everything we have for now other than our final splash screen. But, well, uh... you need to go find the Pinafrina Spider. I mean, the Pinafrina Bertone, uh, the Bertone Pinafrina X19 and the Pinafrina Spider. There, okay. yes. That was that was on my list to include. I couldn't find the photos in time. I'm sorry. I'll see if we can now call my son Mark and see if he has some because he has storage all over the world. I keep nothing and he keeps everything. I would uh, would like to point out while we're talking photos uh, in the in the top left there. I believe that is you in that Yugo, sir. Uh, um. And, uh, well, I'll let you know. The 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 photo was was presented to me as Malcolm Brooklyn in a Yugo at the factory. So apparently that's it. Might be. Talking. It might be. It might be. Wonderful. So uh, just a reminder to everyone, this is going to be a Q&A. So we, we've thrown out some photos as uh, sort of some starting points uh, just to, you know, just to show the breadth of, of the discussion. Wait a second. One second, time. doctor. In the Yugo ad, the little kid in the in the front was that little boy that you saw up in Lake Tahoe. That went right He's a there. Baby. That's Jonathan. That was a baby. He's now 45 years old. Unbelievable. Yeah. Would that be Jonathan Bricklin? That's Jonathan Bricklin. Excellent. Oh, starting us off with some good trivia. <laughs> yeah. um, Very fun. So we've got some. Uh, we've got some. Actually, that was my girlfriend already. at the time. Behind him. <laughs> Behind him was my girlfriend at the time. Excellent. Good thumbs up. Now this is the real behind-the-scenes history, right there. Absolutely. You're Absolutely. not going to see that on a Netflix. Uh, you know. I special. have to tell you a funny story about the stamp and the coin they made. Mm -hmm. They both come from the post office and they sent me a letter from the post office and they told me they were making the Brooklyn coin and they showed me a picture of it and they're making the Brooklyn stamp. I thought they were calling me up to tell me how much royalty they were going to pay me. They announced <laughs> that as many as I wanted to buy, they were going to pay for the postage because <laughs> it was the post office, the Canadian post office. So we've got some, some questions coming in. Um, Alan wants to know uh, how much you were involved in sort of just the selecting the final designs for the Brooklyn SV1, more specifically oh, the front door, design in general. 100%. I am not a designer and I am not an engineer, but I knew exactly what I wanted. And when Herb Grass kept drawing and playing with it, when he finally got to that, I said it was perfect. How many how many sort of rough concepts did the project go through? How many how many beta or alpha Bricklins didn't make it through the final design process? Uh, I probably looked at drawings. Uh, first, we made a, a car, uh, Bruce Myers. Bruce Myers is famous for the Myers Manx. He invented the dune buggy in California. I met with him and he actually built the first prototype. And that first prototype, which is called the Gray Ghost, looks a pretty much like this car, but not. This is very professionally done. That was done quickly. And and as somebody told me that I hired that knew what the heck cars were all about, he said, there won't be one nut or bolt in your prototype that'll be in the real car. Um, that, that gray car was the car that John DeLorean asked me if he could use to design his car. And if you see that car today, it looks very similar to the DeLorean. Interesting, interesting. Hmm. Um, another, another Brooklyn question. I feel like we're going to get a lot of those. Uh, Dimitri yeah. wants to know, um, what, was your, what was your first meeting with Richard Hadfield like? Uh, did you have to uh, do much to sell him on the idea? Somebody of told or? me, somebody wanted to introduce me and said that, that he's a great guy and he's going to really like what you're doing. And I am sure he is going to do whatever he can to get you here. I met with him. I liked him immediately. I mean, he's a, he was a very charming man. And he said, very simply, Malcolm, if you can really do what you say, I want you here 
because my goal is to try to let people know where New Brunswick is, and we do more than cutting wood and fishing. He said, I want the publicity that we are out there. And this car, if you can produce it, will give me what I'm looking for. And so I liked him immediately, and I, I liked him ever since. He was a tremendous human being who really, really gave a damn for the province. He was a fabulous politician. And as I said, I wasn't happy with what his decision was when he made that decision, but I have been nothing but the greatest respect for him and everything he did. Just, um, okay, a more general question. Um, actually, for, oh, we lost Dr. Bateman. I'll wait for him to come back. Um, but uh, Mr. Brickland, what, uh, Diana wants to know, what sparked your interest in cars? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I am not a car guy, excuse me, for the last 50 years, I've been a car guy. But prior to that, I liked, I liked beautiful cars. You know, I had a few Corvettes, I had a few nice cars, I had a Lamborghini, but I was not a car guy. I just liked pretty cars. I fell into it. That rabbit scooter that you saw was part of a story that led me to Fuji which led me to them showing me around their, their factories, which led me when they told me they had sold the factory for that rabbit and to Israel and they were dismantling it and showed me that. So I couldn't have the thousands that I thought I could sell. I told them I wanted the little car, not because I was a car guy, but because it cost 640 bucks FOB Oklahoma and a hundred dollars transportation and $14 duty. And I knew at that price, somehow I could sell them. And they were being very polite to me. And they told me, well, we'd love to sell them to you, except we don't think there's a market for a small car like that in the United States. And number two, this is 1967. And number two, in 68 to 69, the federal regulations were starting to come in for safety. And so them being polite to me, because I have, if we get into it, I'll tell you the story, how I had been screwed on a contract that I thought I had signed from them. Uh, and they were very frightened that I might sue them. And they were scared to death in 1967 of a possible suit in the United States ruining the reputation. Now, I had no intention of doing that in any way, shape or form. They had nothing to do with what the problem was. Uh, so they were being very polite. Now, remember, I'm 28 years old. I am wearing Peter Max ties and double breasted suits and sideburns down to here. And they're totally gray. And there's nobody under 50 and I'm 28. So I'm from Mars as far as they're concerned. And they're just being really polite with this strange person that came in from nowhere. Um, so they told me, I'll tell you what, we'll give it to you. Give us a million and a half dollars so we can meet the regulations. And then you can have it, which is like saying, go screw yourself. So I went, okay, thank you very much. I wasn't going to give them a million and a half dollars. I mean, I didn't know what the car business was all about. I just knew it was cheap and it was ugly, which is the way I advertise it, by the way, cheap and ugly. Uh, and it sold for $12.95 retail and we set up dealers. But my problem was I didn't want to give them money until I figured out what it is I could do with the car. So I flew back to Washington and I went into NHTSA, which is the highway safety uh, organization. And I asked for the book on the safety rules. And they gave me a book, two inches thick, two or three inches thick. And I take it out to the lobby and I start reading it about four or five pages in, I realize there's no way in God's earth I will ever understand what this is all about. That's not gonna help me. I went back to the front page and it said, these regulations apply to all cars over a thousand pounds curb weight. Boom, 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 back in the office. Excuse me, what's curb weight? Curb weight, they explained, is all the fluids in the car. If it has air conditioning, air conditioning fluid, brake fluids, every fluid, whatever that weighs. I open up my brochure and it says 960 pounds curb weight. I said, now, what do I do with this? I said, well, you take it down to the IRS and they'll give you an exemption. And I said, how long is it after I bring in a car that I brought in because it was exempt before you can tell me it's no longer exempt? Oh, they said, here's how it works. People have to complain. If we get enough complaints, we'll have to hold hearings. After we hold hearings, if we decide to change it, it's two years. I said, are you telling me 
that from today, if I brought it in, I have two years. They said, nah, you probably have 10 years the way it works. I said, thank you very much. Where's the IRS? They directed me to go. I went down there with the brochure. They gave me an exemption. I went out and hired a guy that was 55 years old. So I would have somebody that looked more mature than me. Called up Fuji, actually Telex Fuji. Told him I'm coming over. I want to meet with the board. And this will be my last meeting if we can't agree. Well, they were really happy because now they're going to get rid of me. Flew into Tokyo and it was snowing that day. And that is not a common thing in Tokyo. And it was, everything was like crazy. The snow was making peacefulness in this crowded city. I was nervous as can be because this is going to be my last chance to get what I now thought I wanted. And we sat down on the board and I said to them, listen, no matter how this happens, do not worry about me doing anything that's going to hurt your reputation in any way, shape or form. Uh, I appreciate all your help and your being polite to me and I can't thank you enough, but I have to tell you so we don't waste any more time. I'm very powerful politically in the United States. And I said, I know you think I'm full of shit, so let's get down to it. If I can get the United States to give me an exemption so I can bring the car in without meeting any safety regulations, do I have a contract? They said, absolutely. I ripped out the piece of paper that was signed by the IRS and Subaru of America was born. Great story, thank you. Great story. Um, we've actually got a question for Dr. Bigman. Um, Emily would like to know the sort of story, why did you decide to donate your Brooklyn if, it, if it's clearly a car that means so much to you? Well, uh, I've owned, I owned my Bricklin since I was 18 and I used to work on them on the air door systems. So I knew everything about the car inside and out and my car was redone by our uh, technical guru, Terry Tanner. The car is acrylic, as you know, and there's not as many all acrylic cars. My car is absolutely perfect. If you go on uh, Museum Quality Bricklin on YouTube, you'll see me giving you a tour of my Bricklin. And now that I'm in my 60s, you know, remember, I've had this car since I was 18. I started thinking about, well, what if something happens to me? What's going to happen to the car? And I just didn't want it to go to some Joe Schmo. And believe it or not, when I spoke <laughs> with Alex, he told me that the Canadian Automobile Museum does not have a Bricklin. There's a banner on the wall that says Bricklin. And I couldn't believe it. And after talking with Alex, I, I trusted what he wanted to do with the Bricklin. And I not only donated the Bricklin, but boxes of Brickline magazines, uh, the Brickland stamp, Brickland coins, um, the book on the Brickland with Malcolm's dad measuring a frame on the car. I mean, you've got 40 years of me collecting all the memorabilia I can possibly have. So my dream in the Canadian Automobile Museum would be to have that car on display, not tucked back somewhere, even on a turntable with um, cases with all the memorabilia that's around there because it's the most popular car ever made in Canada and it's the first safety sports car ever built. Um, I love the car. That design is timeless and to have my car signed by uh, Malcolm and Herb Grassi on the carburetor cover um, and winning best of show. If you remember Malcolm in Massachusetts, you can't have it a better car and I wanted my car preserved and I didn't want someone to run into the ground and I felt that the museum was very open to taking care of the car correctly. And now that the border's open, I'm hoping to visit you all next year to make sure you adjust those air doors right and um, take care of that car. So whatever happens to me, I know that car will live on in perpetuity. That's the reason why I donated it. Oh, excellent, thank you. And we should mention that when you were 18, we met in Lake Tahoe. Oh, that's correct. If, you, if all of you don't know, this was not my first Bricklin. I had the 81st one off the line that was safety green and I'm in Northern California. So here I am driving my Bricklin as a hot, 18 year old in Lake Tahoe. And all of a sudden these uh, girls like honking their horns and stopping me. And they go, wow, you have a Bricklin. And I go, oh, you know what the car? Oh, sure. Would you like to meet Malcolm? And I go, what? Oh, Malcolm's my brother-in-law. And I said, are you kidding? So I followed them to a beautiful house on Lake Tahoe. And they go, let me go ahead and get Malcolm. Uh, they're just taking care of the baby. And the baby was Jonathan. Malcolm comes out and introduces himself and it was the nicest person you can ever imagine. And here I am, an 18 year old kid, and we we're going over the car and he actually signed a brochure, which the museum has in a framed, um, remember Alex, it's a framed um, picture of the Bricklin brochure and Malcolm wrote on it, Sandy, keep those Bricklins fixed and running. I enjoyed mm -hmm. meeting you in Lake Tahoe, Malcolm Bricklin. 
And it's amazing that Malcolm remembers that after all these years, because I was 18 years old. I'm 63 now. And I remember that day. I didn't keep that. How many in. people do you think I met in Lake Tahoe driving a Bricklin? Other uh, than you. Uh, uh, maybe I was the only Zero. one. Zero. <laughs> seclusion on the water there, buddy. So uh, <laughs> I wish I would have kept it because I like that 360 engine. It's pretty powerful. And uh, I don't know if everybody knows the story on that, but you got kind of screwed by American Motors on that car, you know, on yep. the engine. I love the Windsor. The Windsor's great, but that 360, that four barrel, man, that 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 car hauled. Yeah. Do you do you want to go into that a little bit more? I think uh, many people watching don't uh, don't realize the difference between I believe a 74 and a 75. There's the engine change. Yep. Um, yeah. This should be Malcolm to explain what what he yes. did. Okay. Uh, He's, he, is, he was there. Yeah. American well, that's a good story. Actually, it was not a good story for us at the time. We had made a, a, a deal with American Motors. They were going to sell us a thousand engines. It was a uh, four, uh, two bar uh, uh, four barrel, four barrel, four barrel. It was a four barrel. It was a it was a great engine. It was a great engine, and we engineered it. And then we have to meet the fifty thousand mile say, uh, uh, emission test, even though they're approved. And that's a real difficult test. You don't just drive fifty thousand miles. You drive X amount of miles at this speed and X amount at that speed. And if anything should happen different than that in the whole 50,000 miles, you start over. So it was important. Everything's ready to go. We're a couple months, uh, maybe three or four months away from production. And I get a call that American Motors called and they're not selling us the engines. I said, what are you talking about? We have a contract. I said, that's what we just got told. I said to my secretary, call up Lundberg who was the president of general of uh, American Motors, tell him I want to see him. And the guy said, I, my message back was, uh, sorry, uh, he's busy, he can't see you. I said, call him and tell him that I want to see him before I start aggravation, that he would wish he talked to me before I did. So he got back to, you got a half hour kid, you know, I'll see you tomorrow. So I flew in, we took a couple of our people, we met him, he had a couple of people in his office, and he said, okay, listen, I'm busy. I don't want to get too far. What is it you want to talk about? I said, I want to talk about that. You just screwed me. You have a contract with me. I spent my money doing it. I don't have enough money to go over and do it again and find another car after I've gotten everything ready for production. And I want those engines. He said, let me tell you a story. He said, I've been around a long time in this company and I've been trying to sell cars for a long time and it's not been easy. Now I can sell every car I build. So every engine I give you is a car I don't sell. So you think I'm going to give you any engines? I said, well, let me tell you what I'm going to do. You're pushing me out the window. I'm taking you and your tie, and we're both going out the window because I'm landing on you, which means if I walk out of this office and I don't have any engines, I'm going straight to Washington to talk about how the big three is putting me out of business. Now, I don't know what that's going to cause you, but I'll bet it's going to be a lot of trouble because I'm a poor little guy that put all my money together and you screwed me with this contract that you signed. I'm not sure how that's gonna turn out, but I'm gonna bet you're gonna wish you sold me the engine. Who the hell do you think you are? And then told me in not nice language, all the things he thought about it. And then said, okay, you got 700 engines, get the hell out of here, go find something else. I said, thank you so much. I'm sorry if I was impolite, but you had actually had me by the throat. Get out of here. And they agreed to sell 700 engines. Now, I'm back in Livonia about a week later. And I'm sitting with Keith Crane, who's publisher of Automotive News. He's mad at me because we will not give anybody a story. The car wasn't really done, ready to, for introduction yet. I didn't want a story. And he had sent a photographer with a camera. And the guy came in and our guys took the camera and broke it. And he was pissed. Now, I didn't really know who Keith Crane was. I, I mean, I did with Subaru, but I didn't really give that much of a damn. And he's in the office and he says to me, listen, Malcolm, we can be friends or not. If we're friends, I can do you a lot of good. I said, I, I want you to do me a lot of good. And let's talk about when we're all ready to talk about people. He says to me, uh, why is Hal Sperlick out in the lobby? I said, who's Hal Sperlick? He said, he's Iacocca's right-hand man. No kidding. Keith, you got everything you want. You want a story, you got a story. I'm, I'm so sorry, but I can't call this meeting over now. And I pushed him out of the office. I go in, Hal, can I, you came to see me? Yeah, come on in. Why are you here? 
well, you know, I'm Iacocca's right-hand man. I said, yeah, Keith just told me. He said, uh, Lee, sent me down. He wanted to know if I could come down and talk to you and go see what you're doing just to let him know what's happening. I said, absolutely, but I'm so glad you're here. I understand you got a 351 Windsor and it's a Canadian, it's built in Canada. I need more Canadian content. Boy, it would really be good if I could have that and get rid of the American Motors motor that I have right now. He said, ah, no problem, I'll handle it. That's how we got the Ford. Now it's not over. Now we are one month away from getting the engines, putting them in the cars and having our introduction. And I am in LA airport in the VIP lounge on the way to Acapulco with my family for Christmas. And I get a call from my secretary. Ford says they're not selling us engines. I said, I don't believe it. I do not believe it. And we had a contract, by the way. I call him up. He's not answering. I call Lee Iacocca. He's not answering. I call Henry Ford. He's not answering. So I left a not nice message on everybody's phone. And I get a call back from Al. Uh, Malcolm, what's your problem? I said, what's my problem? I'm ready to produce and you're now not selling me? Are you completely out of your mind? Let me tell you what my problem is. I'm on my way to Acapulco. If I don't hear back in the next 15 minutes that I got engines, I'm not going to Acapulco for my vacation. I'm going to Washington for my vacation. Hal, you don't want that. He says, I'll be right back to you. Called me back. He said, you got the engines. I said, what happened? He said, the lawyers said, why are we selling him engines? There's no win. If something happens, we're liable. And the amount of engines we're going to sell don't mean a thing to us. So for nothing that we gain, we have a possibility of loss. I said, you know, you're 100% correct. That is the truth. And of course, we do have insurance. But the truth also is that I've engineered your engine into our car and done the 50,000 mile test again. I need you to honor your, your contract. He said, don't worry about it. You got it. And we never had another problem with Ford. Sorry, I'm not hearing myself. anything. There we go. Um, okay. Jumping ahead, let's let's change tax. I'm sure we'll come back to more of the SB1. But we've had an interesting question. Um, what is your opinion on the big competitor in the in the electric vehicle market that you get into? How, how do you feel about Teslas, you Nicholson? Ah, uh, Tesla. Know? Okay. Uh, 13 years ago, I got a call from a guy by the name of Eberhardt. He was actually the founder of Tesla. And he asked me, Next time I'm in California, would I meet with him and Musk? They'd like to talk about the car business. So, of course, I said, of course. So I went when I was in California. I actually, I was watching, uh, was it Jonathan? No, it was another son, Max, who was in the Junior Olympics uh, water polo. He was a water polo champion. So I was in Ontario. They met me in Ontario. Jonathan filmed it. So there was about a three-hour meeting with him and Musk. And we talked about everything. One of the things I tried to impress on him, the importance of having a dealer network, which he told me he has zero interest in. He's going to do it like Apple. He's going to sell it on the Internet. I said, yeah, but there comes the time you need service. And there's also states you're not going to be able to sell in because the dealers have applied laws in the states to keep the factories from putting them out of business. You're going to be caught in the same thing, which he is. There's states he cannot sell in. He's building a factory in Texas. He can't sell his cars in Texas. It doesn't mean you can't own a car in Texas, but you have to go buy it outside the state. And I said, and you're going to have to have service. And I don't know how you, you oh, I'm going to send people to people's houses. I said, you're going down a slippery slope. Well, he proved me wrong. The man has done an incredible job. My hat is off to him. And not only is he building cars, he's sending rockets up in the air and he's drilling boring holes in the floor. And he's sticking things in monkeys' brains. He's, he's one of our true geniuses. He's doing an incredible job, but he will learn that having the dealer network was something that he's going to wish he had. Because as you start to sell more cars, you're going to need service and people are not going to be as patient, especially when they love their product. People love his car. So therefore, if it's down, I had a fraternity brother. He owned the Ness, loved the car. It got hit in the side. Insurance company said, no problem. They told him where to take it. A month goes by, he calls up the insurance company. He said, well, oh, they said, we've, we've decided to total the car. We're giving you a check for the whole car. He says, no, I want the car. 
He says, they told me at Tesla, it'll be nine months before we get the parts. Now, he didn't buy another Tesla. They also told him his insurance will go up 500%. Though there's a lot of people who love his product and they will stand with him no matter what, good or bad. But as you sell millions of them, which he's going to do, you're going to have to have a better service network or it's going to be his downfall. But my hat is off to him. What that man has done is beyond, if, if people really understood how incredible what he has really done, I mean, if whatever they think of him now is terrific, would go up by a hundred. So yeah, I think the man is great. So just talking about um, sort of electric vehicles and, and modern motoring technology in general, what sort of, um, what do you think is, I don't want to say the next big thing in motoring, but what do you think sort of, what, what's sort of the, the dark horse of the automotive world? What do you think is going to come out of nowhere and take everybody by storm? Well, it's not going to come out of nowhere, but it's, I'll tell you what's going to take over for sure. It's autonomous cars. It's, it's a definite, absolutely without a question. Autonomous cars is going to come out, going to be a big hit, and it's going to ruin a lot of car companies because it's the kind of car you're going to buy and you're not going to be buying another one real fast. And you're also going to be able to share that car with other people. I mean, you can wake up in the morning and say, take me to work. And by the way, go back and take my kids to school. And then when you're finished with that, go down the street and pick up my aunt, and take her to do shopping. I mean, you've got yourself a full-time driver who doesn't go to the bathroom and is safe as hell. So autonomous cars, I think, are going to change the industry beyond anything we've ever imagined. And, and it's not too far off, by the way. Absolutely. And do you think this sort of this modern car industry has kind of captured the sporty but safe image you were going for with the SV1? Is there anything on the road now that sort of gives you that same vibe? The, the listen, the they build, everybody them. builds a good car. Everybody builds a car, good car. You want an SUV, you want a pickup truck, you want a sedan. They got a lot of them and they're all good. I mean, they are. They're mostly fun. They got, they've got better and better stuff in there. Uh, electric cars are coming. They are all fabulous to drive. The design is going to be cool. There's going to be less service. It's going to cost you less money for keeping maintenance and gas. But that's the electric part will stay, but autonomous cars is going to put them out of business too. It's going to be electric autonomous cars or fuel cell autonomous cars, and the batteries are going to be beyond belief. You're not going to have any more range anxiety, and they're going to be able to be charged in five minutes. Um, so going back to the, the SV1 story, because we keep on getting questions about those, would you be able to speak up, Peter in the audience, um, wants to know sort of a bit more about the story because there's this this idea going around that at first you approached the government of Quebec about building Bricklands and that somehow didn't work out. Would you be able to talk about sort of how your your initial plans to build a Brickland in Canada before you went to New Brunswick? I'm sorry, I'm not I'm not understanding the question. So the the sort of there's this idea that. Um, New Brunswick and, and Richard Hadfield were sort of your second choice and that you looked at a, I think a factory that used to build Renault's uh, in Quebec. Would you be able to talk more okay. about that? New Brunswick wasn't even a choice because I didn't even know where New Brunswick was before I was introduced. I, when I was there, I loved the people. I liked what we, the premier I just thought was a, really a wonderful guy, uh, but I didn't know New Brunswick. I knew, I knew Georgia, New Brunswick. I used to buy paint from a paint factory in New Brunswick for my handyman stores. All right? I knew New Brunswick, New Jersey. I just didn't know New Brunswick, Canada. But I, I, so it wasn't one of my choices. One of my choices was the factory, the Renault factory that closed down in Montreal. And then I went there and I found out why they closed down and what happened with the labor and so on and so on. I decided that wasn't for me. But I was looking for a factory or a location that would finance the factory. Uh, when we ended up in New Brunswick, the people from uh, Ireland came to see me. And they wanted me to come there before John got there. I was the one who told John to go there. Uh, and I couldn't go, although they offered me all the money in the world to do anything I wanted to do. because they were desperate to have some kind of business there. They were killing people there left and right. Uh, the problem is I had to deal with New Brunswick until I built a thousand cars a month. I couldn't go anywhere. So that wasn't even a consideration. No, but uh, New when I got to New Brunswick, which was, I just sort of went there as a fluke. 
because somebody said that you want to go meet the premier. He's really a cool guy. So I didn't think anything was going to happen, but I really liked him. He really liked me and he really liked the project. I have a question from uh, Howard here, which actually dovetails nicely with one of the questions we were planning on asking you. Um, there's been a, a fairly big new change in U.S. auto manufacturing law recently that allows um, the small scale manufacturer of older model vehicles. Uh, DeLorean, for instance, is going to start up production or a, a small run of DeLorean maybe. soon. Do you, maybe, maybe. Uh, do you think we'll ever see um, new Bricklands or, you know, the, the, the SV2 on the road anytime soon? If somebody approached a, you, would you do it? Would I see what on the road again? I didn't hear uh, the last word. A new one, updated, modernized, contemporaneously built. No, I, I, you saw the, the pictures of the little white electric car. Electric is where it's going. It's going to be called the Brooklyn 3 EV because it's a three-wheel car. And everybody said, why? Because back in the 1990s, I met a man by the name of Malcolm Curry, Dr. Malcolm Curry. He was just retired as chairman of Hughes Aircraft. He was the one that did the EV1 for, uh, for uh, General Motors, the first electric mass produced cars. His team that he put together did it. And he was really mad that they eventually brought them all back in and crushed them. So he said, you know, when he met me, come on, maybe we can figure out some way to get an electric car going. So we played for a year using all sorts of batteries from computers. And the problem was we got 30 or 40 miles if we took your car and changed it to electric. And one day I was driving it and I realized if I tried to get back to Malibu and I ran out of uh, energy, how in the hell, what am I gonna do? I, I can't get a jump. Somebody's got to tell, oh no, I can't sell this. This is, doesn't make sense. So we decided it's way too early. The battery technology just isn't going to happen in 1990s. And we then said, well, what is it we can do in transportation, electric, that makes any sense? And we started the electric bike industry in the United States. It was called the EV Warrior. And it was designed by Design Work which at the time was owned half by BMW. Now it's owned 100% by BMW. And they won all sorts of awards and everybody loved them. And I set up a whole dealer network and the dealers got the prestige. They were selling an electric vehicle, even though it was a bike. And there was, of course, one flaw in that. And what's the flaw? Everybody loved it. You got on it, you drove it, you pushed the button. Oh my God, this is the best thing in the world for 1200 bucks. But none of the salesmen in the dealership wanted to sell it because they only made 50 bucks and that was their up. So if they, somebody came in, I want a bicycle, everybody went, you know, there's the bicycle, go drive it. If you like it, there, you go to the, the desk over there and they'll sell it to you. It's still sold and they still liked it. There was another flaw. The people buying electric bicycles would drive them on the road, but they weren't bicycle people. Because for that electric bicycle was totally different than a regular bicycle. They were looked down on. They didn't like them on the bicycle paths. And if you don't know what you're doing driving a bicycle and you're riding on the road with traffic, you got yourself a problem. You got to be scared to death. So you ended up driving it in your driveway around and showing everybody how it rode, but there wasn't a lot of places to ride the bike. So it was successful in that we sold them and everybody loved them, but there wasn't a lot of places for them to drive it safely on that. So I decided it wasn't for me. And Dr. Curry decided he was going to go make them cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and sell them through Walmart, which he did. But I left the business to him and went off to Jet Propulsion Laboratory and started to play with fuel cells. Um, actually, a, a question. So there, oh, there was a point to the story. The point to the story was electric. Right. So we, I started playing with electric back then. And I kept looking at the batteries and the batteries, and the batteries, and the batteries. And about 07 or 08, I realized electric was going to happen in a big way. That everybody was going to get an electric. Lithium batteries were starting to be almost good enough to be able to propel the industry. And I started to say, is there a reason for me to be in it? Because I sure as hell don't need another SUV, no matter how cool I thought I could make it. They didn't need another pickup truck. And they sure as hell didn't need another sedan. And I played with making and designing and people bringing them in and all these different things. And they look great. I said, but who needs it? Everybody's going to be doing the same thing. They don't need me to do it. But as you talk about electric, what you hear, save weight, save weight, save weight. That's the mantra of electric. So I said, 
how much weight do we save if we take off one wheel? And you'll be surprised. It's not the wheel that you take off. It's everything attached to the wheel saves 1,500 pounds. You know what that means? That means I can give you the same performance, distance and zero to 60 for half the batteries. Therefore, I can sell a car for under $30,000. And a gorgeous car doesn't cost you one penny more than a not gorgeous car. The reason most people don't build gorgeous cheap is because that's not their selling mode. You sell vanilla cheap and you get better looking as you get up in price. You get better interior, you get better performance. You get better, how else are you gonna get them? You, you don't make a lot of money when you sell it for less money, but you take half the batteries and you save enough money to sell it for under $30,000. So I said, but it's gotta be gorgeous. It's gotta have a great interior. It has to have great performance. It has to have great distance before you charge it. And that's what we created. So that white car is the first. We're not gonna have different models. We're gonna have different exterior designs. So the car is always gonna have the same underneath frame, the same interior and the same doors, but every 50,000 cars is gonna be a new exterior design that will go exactly on the same frame. So that's the next person, all right. Um, Clark uh, brought up some interesting points. You talked a bit about the idea of, um, you know, if you run out of charge, nobody can jumpstart you. And you talked previously about the importance of, of um, like dealer infrastructure. How important do you think is that kind of, you know, the equivalent of you run out of gas so you can call somebody for a top up? How important is that kind of infrastructure, do you think, to the growing electric vehicle market? Okay, first of all, there's range anxiety. I have range anxiety. You have range anxiety. You get in an electric car and you see that dial start going down you're looking for where am I going to charge it? And there ain't enough chargers. If you took all the chargers in the world and you stuck them in Canada, there ain't enough. So for damn sure, there's not enough in the United States. If you own a garage, you put a charger in there and you charge it at night, that's good. That'll, that'll work. As long as you're not going to go, even if you're going to go three, 400 miles, even if you got a map that shows you every charging station, if you pull up to a charging station, somebody, two or three people are ahead of you, you've got the whole day to worry about it. I mean, it's not okay until you can get a five mile recharge. I mean, a five minute recharge. It's not gonna to go to where everybody wants, but we gotta put in more charging things. I mean, a couple million more charging stations for it to be successful. But all the car companies have committed themselves. There's no turning back. So they, they know what I just said better than I know what I just said. So there will be charging stations put all over the place and they will succeed because range anxiety is the biggest problem you have with electric. I got it. Um, Roderick would like to know if you could sort of go back, speak to, to young Malcolm Bricklin in 73, 74, um, and, and give yourself tips for success. You know, what do you, what do you wish you knew then that you know now? Nothing, nothing. I mean, I wouldn't, of course I wouldn't do, I would be smarter. <laughs> That's one thing you get from experience. You get smarter. Uh, but I, I look back at everything I did as just learning experience to get to what I know now. Now, then I didn't know what I was doing. I just, you know, opened the door and there's a dark door and I walked in. Now I know everything I'm doing and it's a really nice feeling, but it came from that. I look back, I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't have willingly done those things knowing the results, but I'm really glad I did. Sorry, I've just received a message from Dr. Brickman or Dr. Bigman, rather. He apologizes for leaving. He's got a plane to catch, but he thanks you all very much for your time. Um, Please tell him it was a pleasure seeing him again. Absolutely, yes. we'll do. Um, we will get him to Canada someday. He's going to give a talk live at the museum. He promised us so. Yeah. Well, let me know when he does that. I may show up. Perfect. Ah, uh, let me see here. Um, Hugh again would like to know. Um, Talking SV once, as predicted. Um, were you ever approached by any of the big three for anything like a licensing deal or building a rebadged Brooklyn or something like that? No, there was no reason they wanted me for anything. First of all, back in those days, they were extremely, um, uh, I don't know what the exact right word is, but they were pretty full of themselves and they thought they knew everything and they did know a lot. And they didn't think they, that anybody had anything. We had a, a number of 
people who came to us from the auto industry who said, oh boy, what you're doing is really terrific. And, you know, go, get, 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 nice going kid with a pat on the back. But no. But there is a story. Wait, there is a story. Before the car was being produced, um, you saw a thing in there called uh, that little race car called Fast Track. That was made, that thing you saw there was actually a 360 underneath that. And what had happened was Consumer Report said, and we were selling 360s like they're coming out, going out of style. And they came out with a report on the front page, a Cadillac and a 360 and said it was a terrible car because it didn't have to meet the regulations. It, you know, it snuck in under an exemption, which is true, but they made the car like it was really horrible and it wasn't, but it doesn't matter. So somebody called me up and said, hey, did you see what Consumer Report said? I said, who's Consumer Report? <laughs> That's how knowledgeable I was back then. And they said, oh, it is. And if you're on the front page, I said, how, what's the circulation? They said half a million. So I said, half a million people won't buy it. Who cares? They said, no, 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 no. That's not what's going to happen. The banks are going to cancel the floor plan at the dealers because every bank reads it. And sure enough, that's what happened. Now I have cars coming in on ships. I got cars going into the stop parts, going into the factory. They're all paid for letters of credit. I had to get rid of them. All right. I had to go back and get the bigger car. I didn't have the bigger car. So first I went back, I got the bigger car. That was a story for another time. But the end of that story was I had to get rid of the little car and I had three boys at the time and they played with Hot Wheels. And one day I came into, I have to look into their Hot Wheels after buying about 4 million of them. I went to the office, I said, get me a bulldozer. We had 20 acres in Pennsylvania at the Subaru offices. And I told them to dig me a crazy little dirt track. And I called Hewer out to make me a clock that would time five different cars going on the track at the same time. I charged a dollar, you got in the car and you drove around this thing in a Subaru and you're up on the hill in the dirt and you drove around and did it in 47 seconds and you loved it. And you, I mean, people, the lines didn't stop. So I started putting them up around because after a while you wrecked the cars and I was getting rid of them and I was making money doing it. I'm in California and I hired a guy by the name of Jack DeLorean, John's younger brother. And we're in California and we open up a place near the racetrack and on, so on a Friday and we're going to close at 10 o'clock. The crowds are so deep, they refuse to let us close. And we didn't close Saturday and we didn't close Sunday. I mean, 24 hours a day, they would not let us close. They, they start ripping down things when we said, OK, enough. On Monday, they closed the Southern California school system because everybody was at the track. All right. Jack saw that. He said, this is really great. How, how long are you going to go keep on building these things? I said, as soon as I'm finished with the 360s, I'm out of this business. He said, but this is terrific. Can I tell my brother, John? I said, be my guest. He said, can they copy it? I said, be my guest. I don't own the idea. And I was, you know, they can have the clock. They can have it all when I'm finished getting rid of all my cars. John got together with Penske and they opened up Malibu Grand Prix, which was the same idea, but a cooler track. It was all paved and cool looking race cars on the thing. So I got to know John DeLorean and I liked John DeLorean. I thought he was a really talented, charismatic guy. One day I get a call, Malcolm, when's the next time you're gonna be in uh, Detroit? I said, I'm there every week. He said, do me a favor, tell me when you're coming in, I'll pick you up. Picks me up in a stretch Chevrolet. <laughs> and he says, would you mind if you took me over and you showed me what you're doing? I said, my pleasure. I said, most of the guys I hired, I hired from your Corvette guys. He said, you'll probably know them. Take them over. And of course, he knew everybody. And he spent an hour talking and looking. We get back in the car. I said, OK, what is it you really wanted to talk about? He said, what would you say if I said I'll be your president? I said, are you kidding me? I'd kiss your ass. Are you kidding? You're terrific. I don't know what the hell I'm doing manufacturing. I know how to sell the cars, but I'm going to have to know what I'm doing manufacturing. Yeah, absolutely. What does it take? He said, well, if I leave General Motors, he said, it's going to cost me a million six. I said, so you want me to buy you as a quarterback for a million six? I said, get your lawyer, come down to Philadelphia tomorrow. You're going to meet John Bunning, president of First Pennsylvania. I'm going to put up my Subaru stock. I'm going to get a million six and give it to you. He said, you're kidding that fast? I said, are you ready to go? He said, yep. Next day he was there with his lawyer, met John. John Bunning said, Malcolm, brilliant decision. John, welcome aboard. I'll give him the check when you're ready. 
I come home. Ah, da, da. I got John DeLorean. He's going to be my president. I am solved. My problems are solved. I get a call from him that night. Uh, Malcolm, uh, my attorney and I were talking, and you know we have to adjust that payment a little to be after taxes. So I thought for a minute or two. And I said, John, you know it's not that much, and you're worth it. But you know, I think we're going to have a problem in the future of whose name is on the back of that car. And that is not open for negotiation. So I think let's not go forward. We didn't. Fast forward. Premier puts us out of business. I get a call from John. Next time you're in Detroit, let's have dinner. Have dinner. He said, I decided I'm going to build a car. I said, what a surprise. What's the name on the back of the car? <laughs> so we talked about it. And I told him, he said, what's your recommendation? I said, first hire everybody you saw in the shop that works for me. They all work for you. They're really experienced in a startup. They'll be good for you. He said, good, I th it's a good idea. I said, the number two, the going doors that seemed to be the problem that we were having to fix, do it. Because without the going doors, what do you got another car? And how are you gonna go get people to go buy another car? All due respect, no matter what it is. He said, yeah, I was planning on doing that. I said, good. And I said, the last thing is, you got to have some way to not have a pain factory. You know that better than me. Pain factory costs 400 million. Good luck getting 400 million for the pain factory and all the other money you need to get the car thing going. He said, uh, yeah, I'm planning on doing stainless steel. I said, really? Because I, I didn't know you could do stainless steel practically. He said, yeah. I said, there is a problem I want you to know from a sales point of view. It's a great idea. And people are going to love it. But no matter how nice anything is, if you have the same thing all the time, it gets boring, it loses its value, and you can't paint stainless steel. You can anodize it, but it's not cool. When you, It's not a cool color for a car. It's not shiny. He said, no, 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 I'm going stainless steel. Said, okay. Then he asked for two more things. He said, Malcolm, the film you used to raise your money in the beginning, yeah. He said, can I have it to use? I said, sure. He said, you have no problem with that? I said, no, do whatever you want. I said, it says Brooklyn on the thing, but you can tell him I was happy to lend it to you, do anything you want. And that's why you'll see his car, you'll see that gray car that we first introduced, you'll see the similarities in the thing. Um, and then he asked me one thing. He said, you got any recommendation where I'm gonna get some money? I said, yep, if you wanna go there. I said, Ireland offered it to me, I just couldn't go. But I guarantee you, your name, they'll give you anything you want. And that's where he went. That's fantastic. Now, by the way, it cost him $300 million and five or six years to get his car off the road. And he knows what he's doing. From the day I said, I want to build the car with all the nonsense, getting a paint factory and turning it into a factory for $35 million, we built our car in two years. His problem was he couldn't sell them fast. He couldn't sell them. He, he sold five or 6,000, but he had a back order. He had no back order. We had 46,000 back orders when the premier put us out of business. And I'll tell you the last story because we're getting to the end. We are. <laughs> the premier and what happened? We were good friends. We went all over the country, Canada and the United States, talking on television together, at Harvard Business School together, everywhere. The purpose was to get publicity for the car and the province. And so he got that. Of course, he loved the publicity. He's a politician. And he loved 1,200 people. I called the UAW in Toronto to unionize us because it was sort of, I think it was every 20 days or every 180 days, if you, if you quit, you got a year unemployment. So we would get 80% turnover because people were used to getting that kind of whatever that deal was. And so I called the UAW to try to help me get people you know, more, more organized. So he liked that. He liked everything that was going on there. And um, one day he comes to me and he says, I need three Bricklands. I said, sure, what color do you want? He tells me. And I said, where do you want them? And he tells me, I said, what are you gonna do with them? He said, I'm calling an election. The first car is gonna come and it's gonna get a crowd. The second car is coming with my mother in it. The third car is coming with me in it. And that's how I'm gonna run my election based on what I've done by bringing the Brickland here and bringing the notoriety to the province. At the, the day after the election, front page of all the New Brunswick papers, all the papers around Canada, actually. Premier wins the Brooklyn election. 
has a picture of the Brooklyn, a, a cartoon drawing of the Brooklyn with him flying out of the top with the Superman S on his thing. And I'm saying, ha, 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 boy, do, do I have this thing locked, the Brooklyn election, da, 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 da. Well, two months later, he comes in the door and he says, I'm closing it down. Now, this is, by the way, we're good friends. So I said, well, that's a bit, the wor one of the worst jokes I heard. He said, it's not a joke, Malcolm. I said, now, why would you do that exactly? You got 1,200 people making really good money. You got publicity up the kazoo. The cars are getting fixed and tuned so that the, all the little problems are getting fixed. And I got 46,000 back orders. Why would you do that? He said, let me tell you un unintended consequences. After I won the Brooklyn election, every day when I go out to talk to the press, there are two things they're willing to talk to me about. How's Malcolm and how's the car? They don't want to hear anything else out of my mouth. So I am stuck with what I used to win the election is now going to follow me for the rest of my career. So here's what I'm doing. I'm closing you down. I'm going to get a lot of abuse. And a year from now, I'm going to another election. And if I win, it's going to be my election. And that's exactly what he did. And he won the election. I think that may be a good story to end the, the yeah. hour. Well, th thank you so much. Um, I, just, I just have one, question, one more question. Sure. Uh, I want to end on a light question. Uh, we've obviously seen, you've, you probably saw the John DeLorean movie that just came out. Uh, I saw it on a plane. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of interest in John DeLorean these days. Um, but as far as I know, I've never seen a major Hollywood picture on you. Uh, so yep. who, who would you want to see play you? Uh, who, who would be young Malcolm Bricklin uh, in a, an upcoming well, movie? Well, one of my friends... Out? that I met in this process, who became a very close friend, was uh, Paul Newman. Okay. But he isn't around, so I can't have him. <laughs> He's not so care. young anymore. <laughs> I don't care. I'm not ready for a movie yet. I haven't done enough stuff yet. When I've done enough stuff that makes me happy, they can do whatever the hell they want to do. Okay. Thank well, so thank much. you so much. Uh, thank you for everyone who... I, I don't think a single person, uh, participant, dropped out yet. So you, you held everyone in here tonight, um, except for uh, Dr. Bigman, who we appreciate uh, him joining us. Tonight I'm really glad I got to see him. I mean, it was a really unusual situation when they pulled me in with this guy with the car. Yes. With, and, and my son had just been born, by the way. We delivered him at home in a snowstorm on Friday the 13th. Oh, wow. Oh, my <laughs> I gosh. delivered. I feel like we could talk for hours, but uh, I do promise our audience we'll, we'll wrap it up right here at 8 p.m. Uh, Guys, it was my pleasure. Excellent. We will definitely be in touch. Uh, we are uh, we are going coming up to the the working on the 50th anniversary of the Bricklin uh, is coming up here shortly. Wow. So we are going to be doing a lot uh, with that at the Canadian Automotive Museum. Obviously, we work with our friends in New Brunswick and other car museums. So we will. Uh, you're you're going to be uh, you know the talk of Canada uh, once again what with that more big can anniversary I ask for? coming up. Right so, uh, so we will definitely be in touch, and uh, I appreciate it so much you volunteering to to speak with us tonight. Thank you guys, and to I think you're extremely professional, and it was my pleasure. Thank you Talk so much you again, and I think you'll probably see me before, before, before something. Okay, and when you're <laughs> in Ontario, you let us know. You got it. Have a Perfect. nice. Day.